The only problem with the choral anthem was it was too short. I love that. I hope that's true of the sermon. You see, my problem with talking about this material is I try to work too much in every Sunday. And I don't know quite how to get around that because there's a stuff I want to tell you and I don't want to spend the rest of my ministry in the first chapters of, of Genesis. I want to get back to Jesus. We're heading for Easter and the, and the, the cross. And... Uh, the first 11 chapters of Genesis, I want, us to give, I want us to have some understanding of how best to read those unusual chapters. They're unusual in the whole Bible. Because they're, they're what we call prehistory. They come from a time originally when people couldn't even read and write. And some, in fact, some of the stories would come from a time before writing had been invented. They're that old. The roots of those stories are that old. The first historical figure we have in the Bible that we would call a real historical person is Abraham. Abraham who received God's call when he was in Ur of the Chaldees. That's somewhere up in Mesopotamia and he was told to drop everything that he did and leave everything that he had including all of his household gods and to take a journey with the one true God down to what we now speak of as the Holy Lands or Canaan the land of milk and honey, as the Bible calls it. By the way, those are pretty good together. If you, you know, just, just a hint. I sometimes, right before I go to bed at night, will take a dip of honey and uh, dip my spoon in a little bit of milk. If somebody told me I was going to a land of milk and honey, just like Abraham, I'd be ready to go. And he was. There was something he couldn't leave behind, by the way, something he carried in his mind. That was his old stories. The old stories about creation, the old stories of an old story about the Tower of Babel, uh, the old story about a flood. Those he brought with him. They underwent a kind of spiritual transformation among the Hebrew people to serve their purposes in proclaiming God's way with humankind. There are seven stories that made it into the Bible. The first creation story, the second creation story, Cain killing his brother Abel, which we'll call a separate story from the second creation story, although that's Adam and Eve and then Adam and Eve's boys. The story about giants, which is the weirdest story in the whole Bible. The flood, and we'll call this a, se a separate story, the story of Noah's nakedness, which nobody quite understands and then the last of these stories is the Tower of Babel those stories Abraham brought with him we're talking about well I hadn't intended to but as you say this is a I'm live I'm not pre-recorded you know what that means. I mean, I'm kind of like uh, 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 Jimmy Fallon. I'm live. <laughs> and in color, you notice. In color. And uh, so we never quite know what's going to happen. So, so I'm going to read that weirdest 
of storage to you right now. We're destroying the mind. When people, is in chapter 6, by the way, when people began to multiply on the face of the ground and daughters were born to them, the sons of God, that's the way they refer to angels, and in the King James translation, I think it actually says angels. The sons of God saw that these women were fair. They were good to look at. Purdy girls, as we said back in the country. And they took wives for themselves of all that they chose. Now you get things like this in Greek mythology where the Greek gods are always messing around with mortal women. This is the only time anything weird like this sneaks into the Bible. Where these angels see these mortal women, and they mighty good looking, and <laughs> they marry them. Uh, and uh, they have children. They have big children. Obviously, if you have a child with an angel, it's going to be a little different. And they took wives for themselves of all they chose. And then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in mortals forever, for they are of flesh. Their days shall be a hundred and twenty years. Yeah, we should be so lucky. The Nephilim, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. That's the giants. Those, those big babies grew up to be giants. <coughs> and also afterward, when the sons of God went into the daughters of humans who bore children to them, those were the heroes that were of old, warriors of renown. Now, why did they put this story in here? Because all of those first 11 chapters are like one long sermon. And the folks who put it together, they were like preachers. And they were saying, they probably had a discussion about it. Hey, now, here's what we're trying to show. Here's what they were trying to show. They were trying to show where sin came from. And they were trying to show how sin spread across the face of the earth just like wildfire. Beginning with Eve taking a bite of that banana. We don't know what kind of fruit it was. And then hubby doing that. And then the boy kills his brother. And then there's a fellow who kills somebody else and brags about it. And it just gets wusser and wusser and worser. Until God decides Lord have mercy well he wouldn't say Lord have mercy he wouldn't say mercy me he would say what a mess look at what I have done I have made the biggest mess I, I could have made these things are just uh, just like a bunch of evil ants I'm just going to wipe them out and start all over again. Now, this may not sound like God in the New Testament. I mean, when the prodigal son left home, daddy didn't even lecture him. He just waited patiently at the window when he came back. And when he came back, he didn't lecture him either. He just ran to him and opened his arms and received him. This is why Jesus always determinedly called God Father so you couldn't even address God without talking about that relationship which he had revealed to us. In these old stories, that's not exactly the relationship we have with God. And the way God deals with sin, which these opening chapters, pictures are spreading across the earth, is not the way God is pictured dealing with sin in the teachings of our Lord. And the reason this whole story got in here is because this shows those women getting above themselves and... Uh, having relations with someone above themselves. And this was, a, this was a sinful thing 
and uh, it just shows sin spreading and it also accounts to them for the heroes of old whom they believe were 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 giants in the earth now what i'm trying to tell you is that the material that we're dealing with here is in some ways a little primitive any of you ever drive a Model T? You're going to reveal your age here, perhaps. Ever drive a Model T? Well, I haven't either. But I, I remember some car in the family history when I was a very young child where the only way to start that baby was to go around to the front of it, in front of the grill, below the grill, where there was a hole where you put... Keith, have you ever done this? Have you cranked a car? You have. I don't think I ever did it, but I watched it done where you put the thing in there and you would crank that baby up to get it started like you, uh, like you have to, you know, pull a cord to crank a lawnmower. I love old cars. I think they are beautiful. I love these stories. I think they are beautiful. But I don't get my theology here. I get my joy here in reading them. And the Lord can take these stories and quicken them for us. Quicken them for us. And bring them to life and can speak to us through these stories. Don't discount them. But don't get your image of God from here either. Don't do that. Because when you get to Jesus, I started to say in comparison to the Model T Ford Jesus is like a, a Lexus or a DeLorean. But no, those things are accessible. The teachings of Jesus are like a galactic uh, transporter. He's like something still so far beyond us that we can't catch up to it. When I read these stories, I think, well, that's, that's kind of primitive. When I read Jesus, I think, not only is that not primitive, even though it's from 2,000 years ago, that is so far ahead of us in its grace, its compassion, its understanding that we will not get there. Humankind will never get there. And God knew from the start we would not get there, we could not get there. Still, he asks us to try. He said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to love others as I have loved you. So we're not getting our theology of God here. Now, this is going to be discouraging to you. I, I, I hate to be discouraging to you, but this is going to be a little bit discouraging because it seems like I have already preached a whole sermon and I'm only now getting to the scripture reading. Now that's a little bit frightening. You didn't leave the stove on, do you? Well, actually, by some great miracle, I seem to have a little more time this morning or either that or my watch has stopped. Okay. You don't really need to start worrying until I start shaking it to see if it's going. Now the man knew his wife Eve and she conceived and bore Cain saying, and I love these, these are charming words. I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. Well, she liked that. And she produced a second man. And she had two sons, Cain and Abel. Now we're going to look down uh, at, well, just look at verse 3. It's on the back of your bulletin. No, we're going to go, go back to 2. I'm sorry, I'm not going to leave anything out. Next she bore a brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a tiller of the ground. Remember those old westerns, the farmers against the sheep herders? And uh, no lone ranger to come in and save the day here. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel, for his part, brought of the firstlings of his flock, their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry. And his countenance fell. Don't you love the old language? His face fell. His countenance fell. He frowned. 
Now, the question that was raised to me by one of you last week was, how did Cain know that his offering had been refused? Because God was right there. He was standing there. See, we don't tend to think as they thought about God. God was standing right there. When they built the temple for God, they were building the temple for God. Where did God live? God lived in the temple. God lived in the Holy of Holies. That was his home among them. And it was the most holy place in the world because God was in there. Compare this to the New Testament understanding. Jesus told the woman of Samaria sitting at the well in that absolutely glorious dialogue which they had which is one of the wonders of the New Testament. He told this woman, this nobody whom he loved and cared about, uh, who was a very sinful woman, by the way, and uh, he told her, he said, you all, you Samaritans, you worship on that mountain over there, and uh, the people, the Hebrew people, they worship in the temple. But he said, God is worshipped in spirit and in truth. And the day will come when you neither worship on that mountain nor in the temple. Because God is worshipped in spirit and in truth. You're not going to find him standing around in the room. You see the contrast. When our Lord was crucified upon the cross... The curtain in the temple, which separated the Holy of Holies from the whole rest of the world, was torn from top to bottom. Was ripped from top to bottom. It was God's declaration that this one whom people had pictured as boxed in this box was out in the whole world and his son our Lord had just given himself for this whole world on that cross. His countenance fell and the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, you will not be, you will, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at your door. Its desire is for you, you, but you must master it. Now we need to listen to the Old Testament sometimes when it talks about sin because that's the way it works. And things are going to go from bad to worse with this boy. Cain said to his brother Abel, let us go out into the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. And then the Lord said to Cain, the Lord came to Cain, walked up to him and said, where is your brother Abel? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? These are wonderful lines. Doesn't that line come to you sometime? When people are disdainful of the neighbor? How often do we see that attitude, that sinful attitude lived out in the world? Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. Now the way God deals with sin here, the way the folks who first loved this story and cherished it saw God dealing with sin always, always is quick and swift punishment. Quick and swift punishment. And now, God said, you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it will no longer yield to you its strength. You will be a fugitive presence of the Lord. No. Something's left out. 
uh, you will be a fugitive, and I'm going to have to read it uh, from, uh, from the book, uh, because when I cut it to stick it on the back of here, uh, I loused up. You will be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment, and how sad these lines are, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Today you are driven away from the soil, God said, and I shall be hidden from your face. I, sh you shall be a f I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, Cain says, and anyone who meets me will kill me. And then the Lord said to him, not so. Whoever kills Cain will suffer a sevenfold vengeance. And the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who came upon him would kill him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. And the punishment was severe, and the punishment was swift, and the punishment was devastating. And that's not the way Jesus worked, is it? Who could have made a bigger mess of things than Simon Peter? I don't, I, I, don't know that, I don't know that Judas made a bigger mess of things. Judas just took it differently. He killed himself. Simon Peter might have thought about that at times. He denied the Lord. He watched them beat him and pretended that he didn't even know him. He told everybody there, asked him, aren't you with this guy that's getting beaten up over there? Peter said, no. What did God do after that? Did, did he said? Did God say to him through Christ or directly or in any way, you, you are no longer mine. I'm, I, I'm not going to have anything to do with you. I'm going to drive you from my face. I'm going to put you away from me. God pursued him. I want us to consider ourselves to be pursued by God. When we weigh these old stories in the balance of what the New Testament tells us about God, I want us to cherish these old stories and realize what they say to us about sin. And when it comes to God's answer to sin, I want us to pick up that New Testament image and go with it. There is nothing that we can do, nothing in heaven and earth that you and I can ever do that will make God push us away from him. Our Lord pursued Simon Peter. Pursued him. Sought him. Hunted him out. Even after Simon Peter had returned to his old life fishing. He came to him, came to the other disciples on that fishing boat. And when he asked Simon Peter three times, do you love me? Which was his way of lifting the guilt and lifting the burden which Simon was carrying. What God actually asked him is, do you love me? And he used a word that he always used for love, which is agape. And, and Simon would say, yes, Lord, I love you. But he used the word for friend. Not that all-giving love that God was asking for through Jesus Christ. He asked him again, do you love me? And he used that agape love. That all-giving love. That love that is so difficult for us because it asked us to love the enemy the way God loves his enemy. And Simon Peter said, Lest you, you know that I'm your friend. And the third time Jesus asked him that question. He doesn't say, your offering's not good enough for me. What you're giving me is not enough. He goes down and he takes that little word for friend, philos. And he says, are you indeed my friend? And Simon Peter says, you know that I'm your friend. He says, then I want you to feed my sheep. I want you to. And he gives an image of the way he's going to die from then when he is going to give his all for him. And why? Because the power of the gospel is in the grace. And what I want us to understand is that, that whatever you think we, we, you may have done in life, whatever mistakes you've made, whatever mess you've made of things, I know this isn't going to sound right. We think everything should count against us. But God is not counting it against you. When we make a mess of it, God bleeds and God hurts. But he does not change his love for us. Receive that word. This is what came to us in Jesus Christ. And I know of no other source from it, for it. 
I know of nothing like Jesus Christ in all of the world. I know of nothing like Jesus Christ even in all of the wonder and beauty of the Old Testament. He was new. He is new. He is ahead of us. He's not behind us. And the more we can listen to his love for us and feel that love, the better off we're going to be and the happier we're going to be and the more encouraged we're going to be because God is never going to give up on you and me. God will never give up on you and me. God will never give up on you and me until he has us where he wants us. Therefore, beginning this moment, this day, let us say to him, here I am, Lord. You know where you want me. Take me where you want me to go. May his name be praised. I have one more sermon in this series. I'm not going to preach it next Sunday. I'm, I'm going to encourage all of you to see a movie. And then I'm going to have a sermon talking about how Hollywood handled it. And that's the movie Noah. Now I'm going to talk about Noah and the flood. It's coming out very quickly. Russell Crowe is Noah. And I think it's fascinating. They wanted all evangelical Christians to come and see it. We don't put ourselves in particular that particular category. We're, we're Christians, but very conservative. They want all the very conservative Christians who love movies about the the, the Bible and so on. I love movies about the Bible too and I find Christ figures in all kinds of movies but they want them to come and see it in droves so they make a lot of money. But already a lot of uh, conservative Christians are fussing because they've introduced some woman in there who's not in the Bible. Well you got to have some woman in there you know. Uh, every movie has to have some woman in it. And uh, <laughs> they, they've, and, and they have uh, there, there are a lot of special effects but there's, 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 there are things they're objecting to, and they're not just following the biblical script. Well, you can't do that when you, when you, when you make a movie. But I heard Russell Crowe talking, uh, and he doesn't even know what to say uh, to, to make the folks he wants to do the kind of movie. He says, uh, you know, Noah, Noah's not even a nice guy. He's not even a decent person. That's obvious. Uh, he's not doing the right PR work. Because that, that understanding was that Noah was the best person in the world. It's going to be interesting when the movie comes out. I'd like for us to go see it. I may set a time when some of us can go see it together. And then I'm going to have a, one more sermon in this series on the flood. We've been through a lot of territory in the last, I think it is, five sermons. <clears throat> and now something exciting happens next Sunday. <laughs> I, I get to go back to Jesus in the New Testament as we move toward Easter and the wonder and grace of his cross. I love these stories. I, in some ways I'm in awe of the beauty of them. But I tell you, I trade all of them for any opportunity I could get just to touch the hem of his garment. May his name, who is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, and everything we most desire in life, whether we know it or not, may his name be praised.